Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at Exodus chapters 19 through 40. Let's dig in. Exodus chapter 19, verse 3, we read that Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the sons of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Of course, this is spoken now that they finally arrived at Mount Sinai. Now then, the passage goes on to say, If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. Notice that God says, everything is mine, the whole world is mine, and among all those possessions of everything, you are going to be my special people, my own possession, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. So Israel was called to be, not just uh, to have priests in their, in their community, but they were going to be an entire kingdom of priests. You know, a priest is somebody who represents the people to God. It, it, just the opposite of what a prophet does. A prophet represents God to the people. And so they were going to be a kingdom of priests representing the entire world to God. So you have, you know, God, he's the king, and then a priest normally represents the people to God, as we said. The prophet represents God to the people, and Israel was playing the part of the priest. One question I'd love to bring up is, is in the case of Jesus, which does he represent? The prophet, the priest, the king, and of course the answer is all three. He, is, he represents the prophet, he's the one who, who represented God to us, um, he represents the priest. He represents us to God. He is our, our, our intercessor, our advocate, and of course he is the king. As we come now to the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, we should no notice several things. First of all, they are singular. Uh, the old King James would use the term thou to, to, be, to use the singular versus ye, which is plural whenever you see that. Uh, and the commandments speak individually to people. You, one person I'm speaking to, do this. You, one person, don't do that. Secondly, they can be divided into two primary groups. First of all, there are those, the first four commandments, that are directed toward God. They speak to God and about God, uh, about taking his name in vain, about having only one God, uh, about keeping his day holy. Uh, about not trying to make any graven images of him. And then there are those directed toward men uh, about how you treat your fellow man. You know, you don't murder him. You don't uh, bear false witness against him. You don't take his wife. You don't covet his possessions. You don't steal. So the first four commandments, they deal with Israel's relationship with the Lord. The last six commandments deal with men's relationship with one another. The first four commandments give reasons for each one of those commands. In the last sixth commandment, there are no reasons needed because they are universal commands. They are recognized by everybody. The first four commandments are completely unique to this constitution. There's no other society in the ancient world that had similar laws as are found in the first four commandments, you know, the, the commandments dealing with God. Um, indeed, to the contrary, you went into any other uh, ancient ancient culture, you would find graven images. You were expected to find that. Uh, you might use uh, the that God's name in all sorts of ways, and yet God's name was to be holy. Uh, the last six commandments, uh, these laws are very common to the ancient cultures of that day, and so there is no explanation needed for them. Going back to the Ten Commandments, the stipulations that that follow, and once you get into, you know, you finish the Ten Commandments and then go on into chapters 21, 22, 23, there are a number of other laws, I'm referring to those as the stipulations, and those stipulations that follow serve as further interpretations of the Ten Commandments. That is, every one of those can be, can come under the heading of at least one, sometimes two, of the Ten Commandments. So the, the Ten Commandments are our broad outline, and then further explanations are seen in the subsequent commandments. Exodus chapter 31 verse 18 tells us that when he, Moses, had finished speaking with him upon Mount Sinai, he gave Moses the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone 
written by the finger of God. And so Moses is coming down from the mountain with the tablets. Now, uh, sometimes you wonder, you know, why are there two tablets? Uh, and when I was a lot younger, I used to think, well, perhaps uh, he couldn't fit, fit them all into one. And so you had, you know, maybe half the commandments on one and half on the other. I don't believe that's the case. And when we get to Deuteronomy, we will see that there are good reasons to believe that these are actually two copies of the testimony. And we'll see more about that uh, when we when we get to Deuteronomy. Next, we have instructions for the tabernacle. Uh, and there are some v very detailed instructions given about this tent of meeting, this place where God would, uh, would be worshipped in the midst of the camp. It, notice it was a tent, and there were some accoutrements out front, and then it was surrounded by a portable palisade. The entire tabernacle assembly is going to be, uh, is going to be portable so that as the children of Israel move through the wilderness, the tabernacle can move with them. It can be taken down and then uh, set up again in the new location. As we look at the furniture of the tabernacle, on the outside, first of all, there's a brazen altar. It's, this is the place of the sacrifices. Uh, and this is the place where the, there's going to be another altar inside the tabernacle, but that won't be to offer sacrifice on. This is the one upon which animals are sacrificed. There is also a laver outside the, tab outside the tabernacle in that compound just outside it, uh, which was uh, filled with water and used for purification rituals to, for a priest to purify, ceremonially purify himself prior to going into the tabernacle, prior to having any of the service ordinances in which he was involved. The tabernacle itself was divided into two parts. Uh, first, there was the uh, the holy place. In this place, the one of the priests would go in daily, first in the morning, later on in the evening, um, and and there would be things that he would do. We're going to look at those in a minute. But then there would be a veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place. Now, the way you say most holy place in Hebrew is you say use that word holy twice. So you say holy of holies, um, and that was going to be the inner court. And and in that inner part. Uh, the innermost recesses, only the high priest was allowed to go, and then only once a year. But we'll see that uh, that later. Once you went into the holy place, on your right there would be a table of showbread, 12 loaves of bread representing the 12 tribes of Israel. On your left there would be a golden lampstand, and it was shaped and fashioned as a stylized tree with flowers and bulbs on it so that you had a a golden tree of light, perhaps a tree of life, and it reminds us that in the Garden of Eden there had been a tree of life, and once mankind had been driven out of the garden, it had been guarded by a cherubim with a flaming sword. So those elements, the, the tree and the flame, were all there uh, in this imagery. When we come to the New Testament book of Revelation, we see a, a vision that the Apostle John has of a golden lampstand. And we're struck that this is temple language, but there the seven lamps represent the seven churches. And so perhaps we have a clue as to what this lampstand represents. It represents God's people who are to be the light of the world. Still in that holy place, and, and as you got closer to the veil, there would be a golden altar of incense where each morning and each evening one of the priests would come into the tabernacle and sprinkle incense. This is after the, the morning and the evening sacrifices had been offered outside. After each one of those sacrifices, now a priest would come in and sprinkle incense upon the altar, um, making perhaps a sweet aromic cloud. You can imagine this as a culture that does not have things like deodorant and uh, other nice smelling things that we, you know, of which we take for granted. And so this represented, this was a time of prayer, so it represented the prayers of God's people ascending in a sweet aroma. Think about that, you know, not only hearing the prayers, but actually smelling the prayers of God's people. If one had been allowed to go past the veil, and into the innermost recess, the Holy of Holies, he would find one last article of furniture. This was the Ark of the Covenant, a wooden box overlaid in gold with the statues of two cherubim, 
these two mighty angels uh, with their wings overshadowed over the top of the ark. And the Ark of the Covenant represented the throne of God. You've seen pictures of, of ancient kings maybe being carried where the throne is carried uh, by some litter bearers and, and maybe the slaves on all sides that are carrying the throne of the king as he sits upon it. And this was the idea here, not that you could see God sitting on it, but it, w it symbolized the presence of God, his place of, of rule, his place of abiding with the people of Israel, and this signifies his throne. Now, Moses comes down from Mount Sinai after he's been there for 40 days and he's been receiving the law, he's been receiving the commands, he's been receiving the instructions for the tabernacle, and he comes down, and we read that it came about as soon as Moses came near the camp, that he saw the calf. The Israelites, meanwhile, have fashioned a golden calf to represent their worship of God, and that's, that constitutes idolatry. And he sees the calf and the dancing and, the, and Moses' anger burned. And he threw the tablets from his hands and shattered them at the foot of the mountain. Now when Moses saw that the people were out of control for Aaron, Aaron had you know, been left in charge, for Aaron had let them get out of control to be a derision among their enemies, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered together to him. Notice they were, the, the issue is that they had become a derision among their enemies. That is, as Israel was engaging in a wrong way of worship, they were giving a, a wrong testimony to the rest of the world. They were, instead of glorifying the name of the Lord, they were bringing dishonor upon the name of the Lord. And so the Levites are called together to Moses. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Every man of you put his sword upon his thigh, and go back and forth from the gate to gate in the camp, and kill every man his brother, and every man his friend, and every man his neighbor, so that they are bringing the judgment of God upon the collective tribes of Israel. Verse 28, So the sons of Levi did as Moses instructed, and about 3,000 men of the people fell on that day. You will remember that later when you come to the book of Acts and you have that incident at Pentecost. Now Pentecost was a was a Jewish feast that's going to be established when we get to the book of Leviticus. But by the time of the New Testament it is being used as a memorial of the giving of the law. So that here is uh, Jewish people in Israel have gathered to remember that time when God gave the law suddenly the law is written on the hearts. The Holy Spirit comes down and fills them and there's tongues of fire and there's, they're speaking in, in languages they didn't know. They're speaking in tongues. Uh, and you remember at the end of that day what takes place. Instead of 3,000 people being put to death as we have here in Exodus chapter 32, there are the same number, 3,000 people who hear the, the preaching of Peter and who believe and who become a part of the, uh, that brand new church. So at the giving of law, Exodus chapter 20 through 32, that's what we're reading now, versus the incident of Pentecost in Acts 2. Uh, that took place at Sinai in Acts chapter 2. There, you know, that's taking place in Jerusalem. At the giving of the law, 3,000 people are put to death at the hands of the Levites. In Acts chapter 2, at the giving of the, can I call it the second law, the, the giving of the law that's written on men's hearts, the giving of the Spirit, 3,000 become spiritually alive at the preaching of the gospel. Now, after this, the, the Lord, you know, had said to Moses, you know, Moses, that's it. I'm done with the Israelites. Uh, tell you what, you and I, will, uh, we're just going to going to go on. Or you guys, you guys go ahead into the promised land. I'm not with you anymore. And Moses says to the Lord, if your presence does not go with us, do not lead us up from here. For how then can it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not by your going with us so that we... I and your people may be distinguished from all the other peoples who are upon the face of the earth. Uh, the Lord says, uh, Moses, Moses says to the Lord, he's interceding. He says, uh, if you're not going, we're not going. You know, sort of you go, we go, and we're going to commit ourselves to you. And the Lord said to Moses, I also will do this thing of which you've spoken, for you have found favor in my sight, and I have known you 
by name. So the Lord agrees, okay, I'm going to go with you. Uh, when Israel, you know, departs, uh, I'm going to depart with them. I'm going to continue with you. And, and I don't know if that emboldens Moses, but Moses then says, I pray you, and he's speaking to the Lord, show me your glory. Your glory, that word glory, kabod, literally means weightiness. Remember, this was a, a culture where they didn't have printed dollar bills. In fact, they didn't even have coins yet. Uh, if they wanted to distinguish the value of something, they would weigh it. And so that idea of value and weightiness uh, is indicated in that word kabod, which is glory. And Moses says, show, show me, Lord, your glory. And the Lord says, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. Those are words that, that Paul's going to echo later on in, in Romans chapter 9, verse 20. But he said, you cannot see my face for no one can see me and live. You know, God says, I'm unseeable. If you could see me, you wouldn't survive the experience. So no one can see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me and you shall stand there on the rock. Now, remember how we had that emphasis uh, in the early part of Exodus on the rock that that really represented Christ. We're told that in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And here again, there's an encounter with a rock, and, and Moses is told, you shall stand there on the rock, and it will come about while my glory is passing by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. And then... I will take my hand away and you shall see my, our translation says, my back, although normally this term when it's used in Hebrew is translated my afterward. And, and I, I like the term maybe that you will see my afterglow. But he says, you, my face, my full glory, you won't be able to see that. So you'll be able to see sort of the, the result of my goodness having passed by. And that's going to be as much as you can take Moses. Well, summary then of what we're seeing in Exodus. Sort of, this is sort of a summary outline. I don't want you to see the pattern that's given here. In chapters one through thirteen, we had God meet, you know, where God meets Moses. You know, first Moses uh, uh, is his early life, and then he goes to Midian, and there in Midian, God meets Moses and sends Moses back to Egypt, and he leads them out of the uh, Egypt in the Exodus, so that Israel can I say Israel exoduses or exits from Egypt. That's chapters 1 through 13. And then we had a rebellion in chapters 14 through 18, actually a series of rebellions. Uh, we spoke in chapter 17 about s striking the rock and how uh, the Israelites really wanted to strike God, but instead they were allowed to strike the rock and water came, came forth. And then in chapter 19, where we started this session, we have God entering into a covenant with Israel. Uh, he says, you're going to be my special people. And then he gives them the law and the commandments. Uh, both the Ten Commandments and the stipulations which follow after that. And following the stipulations, next what we have are the commands for building the tabernacle. That's chapters 25 through 31. Very extensive plans on how the tabernacle is to be built, what it is to look like, and 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 the measurements. And, and in great detail, all those instructions are given. Following that, chapters 32 through 34, again we have rebellion. This is where Moses come down, so he comes down with the tablets of the law. He sees the, the golden calf. He breaks them. So that's the period of rebellion of which we're speaking. And then, in chapters 35 through 40, we have the tabernacle being built. And what you have is all those commands for the building of the tabernacle are, near, are now carried out. However, it strikes me that... that Moses could have, I think there's a reason why he didn't, he could have merely uh, said, instead of giving us chapters 35 through 40, he could have just said a, a very brief summary statement. He could have said, and Moses and the Israelites did everything they were told to do. You know, that would just be one verse. And, and we could have ended the book there. But instead, we have great detail given as line by line and blow by blow, and it's almost an exact repetition, not quite, there are a few extra details here and there. But, but largely, it's the same instructions now being carried out as the tabernacle is built. And I think that is for a reason. I think that it is to build suspense for what will be the final um, climactic event. And that is when the tabernacle is finally built, it's finally completed, 
All the instructions have been carried out. And now, as they dedicate it to the Lord, the Lord enters the building. God enters the building. God enters the tabernacle. We read in Exodus 40, verse 34, The cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. God comes and dwells with his people. And it's on that note that the book of Exodus ends. This is what the book of Exodus is all about. It's not just about getting out of Egypt. It's coming out to encounter God where God might dwell with them. 